welcome to our time of uh, looking into God's Word again together. And uh, it's a beautiful day outside, and I hope that you've had a chance to at least step outside and enjoy some of God's creation. We're going to be looking in the Word of God at 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 4 to 10, talking about honoring the rejected cornerstone. And I'm going to read to you from the uh, English Standard Version of the Bible. I'm not sure I need to keep the headphones on. I'm going to take them off uh, for right now. It's just it's kind of uncomfortable. So let me read to you from uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 down to verse 10. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be holy, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And beloved, I urge you, as you are sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against the soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, I've read all the way up to verse 12, because it's all part of that uh, one section there. But um, we're really looking primarily right down into verse 10 tonight. We haven't got time for any more, really, than that. And uh, so, the question is, as we look at this, is do you know who you are in Christ? How significant are you in God's eyes? Just as with human relationships, where we get our, our sense of value and our sense of significance from how those who are important to us, people important in our, in our lives, how they regard or treat us. Likewise, God wants us to know our value and significance in His eyes. In order that we may value our, ourselves and therefore conduct ourselves in line with our self-image and our sense of personal value. Now Peter, here in these verses, seven verses, zeroes in on, on the real source of our value and significance, which is our relationship with Christ. In verses 4 and 5, he picks up from his statement in verse 3 about the, the goodness and the graciousness of our Lord Jesus. This is the hymn that he refers to in verse 4 when he says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer sac spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Does it matter to you that some people reject your faith? Well, they rejected our Lord Jesus and rejected Him in a very serious and significant way. But He is the living stone who was rejected by men but was precious in the sight of God. Likewise, we may be rejected by men because we follow Christ. But from God's perspective, we are chosen and precious. Even as Jesus is referred to as a living stone, Peter calls us living stones. And again, 
We need to underline our value and, 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 and our significance, to underline our value and significance. Uh, Peter points to two distinct realities about who we are. That is to say, our new identity in Christ, so that, so that we gain an insight into who we truly are. He says, we are being built into a, a spiritual house as well as a holy priesthood. Now, in a sense, Peter is mixing his metaphors. We're told sometimes, you know, in writing and uh, in literature, not to mix our metaphors. But, um, but Peter is mixing his metaphors in order to convey the true sense of our value. So as followers of Jesus, we are referred to as, as the temple of God. Now, we know this is not unique to, to, to uh, Peter's writing. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, reminds us in two uh, similar passages, but two separate passages, that both individually and collectively, we are the temple of God. In fact, Paul uses the word for temple, the, the word that he uses for temple actually refers to the, that portion of the temple that, that was known uh, as the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctuary where God's presence dwelt. So you'll find Paul's reference about the fact that the church is collectively the temple of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter well, 3, verses 16 and 17. And then his reminder that our body is the temple of God's Holy Spirit is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. So two, two, separate, two separate distinct places uh, in Paul's writing, not too far apart, he reminds us that we are collectively the temple of God and we are individually, our bodies are the temple of God or God's Holy Spirit. So, Peter is not alone in, uh, in speaking uh, to us of this, this value that God has accorded to us in Christ. Not only are we the temple of God, uh, both collective and indiv collectively and individually, but we are also, states Peter, he says that we are a holy priesthood. I suppose that Peter feels uh, uh, licensed to, to mix his metaphors because we're both building blocks in the temple of God, uh, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as well as we are members of what we, what's called the priesthood of believers, offering spiritual sacrifices through our Lord Jesus Christ to the Father. So again, let me, let me underscore how if we, we truly grasp who we are in Jesus, it will help transform our growth and development as his followers and members of the family of God. Coming to verse 6, we find Peter paraphrasing. It is not an exact quote from either the Hebrew or the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Um, the, in the time of, of Peter, in the time of Paul, there was a translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, the Septuagint. Uh, that 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 was a it was amazing translation. Seventy different uh, scribes separately transcribed the the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, into Greek, and they, they did it without conferring with each other. And amazingly, there was a, a hundred percent consistency in what they did. But they also had, the, of course, the Hebrew Bible. And because a lot of the, the, the Jews had been in the diaspora, had been sent outside or dispersed from, from, from what we call Palestine today, um, the, the, the language they were, more comf they were more comfortable with was actually Greek rather than Hebrew. But of course, Hebrew was, the, the, in a sense, the sacred language. But uh, what Peter is, is quoting, he's quoting from Isaiah the prophet, and he's, it's a paraphrase, really, as I said. It's not an exact quotation. Um, but the quote or the paraphrase from Isaiah 28, verse 16, it's understood that that passage is understood to be a messianic prophecy. Uh, in verse 6, it says, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so the emphasis here is, is for our edification 
and for our encouragement. We who believe in Jesus will not be put to shame. Our confidence will be vindicated in eternity at the return of Christ, just as our confidence is vindicated by the evidence of changed lives right here and now. If we have come to that place of finding uh, our relationship with Jesus, or with God through Jesus Christ, if we have become Christians, we know that something has happened. We know that the change has taken place. We have evidence in our lives that, that God has done something significant in our lives and has changed us, has transformed us. But of course, uh, the reality is that, th that is, this is only a, a, a slight glimpse, a glimmer in a sense of, of what is going to happen in the future. Uh, eternity is the final vindication of the messianic person, the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, and what he came to do. And so uh, Peter continues in, in verse uh, uh, 7, it talks about the fact that, it, it, that we are the ones, the, um, we're, we're, it's honor for us who believe, he says. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now, it's interesting that, that verse 7 is a quote from a psalm. So we have a quote from Isaiah, the prophet, and then we have a quote from the psalm. Now this psalm is Psalm 118, verse 22. Again, it's a well-known messianic prophecy. In fact, it, is, it was from this very psalm that the people took up their welcome cry of, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. Uh, so I think it, it is rather ironic that both their welcome cry and their cry to crucify Jesus is taken from the same messianic psalm. Now, you will have to go there and check it out yourself. Read Psalm 118, verse 22, and you'll see the, the quotes there uh, that the fact is that the, the, the people um, just recognizing he was the Messiah, but later on they decided he was not the Messiah, and so they cried for his, for his crucifixion. Verse 8, again, is back to Isaiah. This time it's, uh, it's uh, from Isaiah chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. And it says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, again, referring to Jesus. And then he says this, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Now, the latter part of verse 8 needs some clarification. As the way it reads at first uh, seems to place, well, it, it suggests to us that the Jews were destined to stumble at the reality of Jesus being the Messiah. In other words, they were predestined to, to not believe him. Actually, the idea in the text is different. When you, when you read it at first, they say, it says, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So what were they destined? What, the, what, the, what was the predestination in this case? Well, actually, the, what Peter is stating is that because they disobeyed the word, in the reality of their disobedience, they were destined to stumble at the truth of Jesus being the Messiah. They were not destined to disobey and they were not destined to stumble it is that because they disobeyed the natural sequence of i of, of things or the natural consequence was that they would stumble this is the, the truth this truth and principle still obtains today those who who disobey the word of god are inevitably going to stumble on the revelation of jesus as lord and christ those who disobey the word of God, are inevitably going to stumble on the revelation of who Jesus is, that he is Lord, that he is Christ. But that's not you. That's not the case with you and with me, my precious brothers and sisters. As we read on in verses 9 and 10, he says, but you, but, see, that, that but, it's, I love the buts of scripture. That transition, that contrast, that word of contrast there, 
He's talking about those who stumbled, those who disbelieved, disbelieved uh, and to them, Jesus was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. But here, for us, it's a different story. Here's what he says about you and me who are, who are Christ followers. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And here again in these, these final verses, we have confirmation and validation from God's word about our value and significance in the eyes of God. We who were not a people, as Peter refers to us, are now God's people. Praise God for this wonderful truth. We who had not received mercy, now we have received mercy. All because of Jesus, the Messiah, who came unto his own, the scripture says, John writes that, and his own rejected him. He rejected by his own people. The chief cornerstone being rejected. But now all who believe in him, who have received him by faith, are included as God's people. Jew and Gentile alike. Again, praise God for his, for his infinite mercy towards us. God calls us his what? His chosen race, a royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for his own possession, a peculiar people. We might have seen another translation, meaning we, we, we peculiarly belong to God, God's own possession, all because of what Jesus our Lord has done for us. Now surely, brothers and sisters, when you reflect on this reality, you will see that, that those who taste that is to say, those who experience will know that the Lord is good. Now, this is from the verse right before when we were taking, uh, looking at tonight, from verse 3, talking about those who have tasted, surely you've tasted, you know that God is good, or God is gracious, or God is, is, is kind and gen generous to us. So, you know that the Lord is good. You know that God is gracious and kind, not only in granting us the gift of, of salvation, but of including us so intimately in all of, his, all of his ongoing work of salvation as members of the church. We have a part to play. We are, the, we are living stones, um, as he calls us. We proclaim his excellences by both our lives and our lips, showing him to be gracious, showing him to be merciful, showing him to be a saving God that takes sinners and makes them into saints, that takes nobodies and makes them the children of God. We praise God for these realities. And so, uh, although the entire passage, the contrast between uh, the, the, those who disbelieve and those who believe, and the contrast about how Christ was regarded and who he really was, when it comes right down to the very to the end of this section here, I've down it to verses 9 and 10. Let's read those again in closing. What God says about you and what God says about me. He says, but you are a chosen race, a chosen generation, it says in, in uh, I think the King James Version, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, or a people for God's own possession. That, that what? That you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you and I were not a people, but now we are God's people. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. Praise God for what he has done for us through Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, as we have taken time to look into your word, we give you thanks tonight for for your, your precious and wonderful word. And we thank you for your blessed Holy Spirit, the one who takes the word and illuminates it, lights it up so that, that it makes sense not only to our minds, but it makes sense even to our spirits. 
so that as we read the word and we, we, are gain, we gain understanding through the work of your Holy Spirit, we're able to understand who we are in Christ. And in the verses that will follow from this, how we are to conduct ourselves because of who we are as God's chosen generation, holy uh, nation. We are a royal priesthood. All the things that Peter says about us because it's who we are in Christ. And so we thank you for this. Father, we, we, we lift up before you now uh, our islands. We lift up our people once again. We lift up our leaders. And we pray that uh, as you have been graciously blessing us in, this, in spite of this, this pandemic that is, is, is bringing a scourge uh, to the earth and taking so many lives uh, already, Lord. We thank you for the, your mercies to us. Surely, we who did not receive mercy have received mercy now. And we, we do not take it for granted. We don't believe it's an accident. We believe because the people of God are, have been praying and, and, and calling upon you that you have acted and we, we, we see the evidence of your hand at work here in these islands. Bless our governor and our premier and our ministers, the cabinet and our legislative assembly. Bless our, the pastors and workers uh, on the front line. Bless those who put their lives at, at risk probably every day in doing certain tasks. And we pray that you would bless your word onto our hearts that in uh, in, that it may, that, that your word may really just find a, a real rooting and, and grounding in us, transforming our lives. And we pray these things in Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we just thank you again for, for the time that you've shared with us tonight. And uh, may God uh, continue to bless you and, 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 uh, and um, cause you to flourish in him. And be a blessing with th to those around you, a, a blessing in your family, a blessing in your community. Find ways in which you can uh, express the, the love of Christ in tangible ways. Uh, call those who are, who are shut in and uh, just cannot get, well, you're shut in maybe yourself, but others are even more shut in you because they're more vulnerable than you. Some of our elders, elder saints and those with, with uh, comorbidities, in other words, they, they have... Um, existing health conditions that make them more vulnerable. Give them a phone call. You cannot transmit this virus by telephone call. And, and uh, I want to thank uh, those from our, uh, my congregation. My wife and my sisters, I guess, arranged something. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, my wife comes to get me about 5 o'clock and says, come on out. And I go out there and there are people driving by in cars and they all got, some of them gathered 10 feet apart or whatever and sang happy birthday to me. Yes, today was my birthday. And I thank God for their, it really touched my heart. I, I want to say to those of you who took time to do that, I know not everybody could come out because it was not your day to come out. But uh, thank you for, uh, for your well wishes. Uh, thank you for those who did it by WhatsApp and, and Facebook and that sort of thing. I'm a year older, actually just a day older from yesterday. But I thank God for his, for his goodness and his mercy. And really when I see what... what um, when I experience things like this, it, it takes me back to, to many years ago when I was actually hanging out clothes on the clothesline. And the words of song just came to me and I went inside and I sat down at the piano and I wrote, I wrote, I wrote the song very quickly. The tune came to me and the, um, and, and the, the, the words came to me. It was about a fact that I had a glimpse of heaven uh, in, in, uh, in ex several experiences with the people of God. And so we're going to close out, and I, I hope this song actually comes across. I, I, I intend for it to come across. I hope you can hear it. I've got a glimpse of heaven. If it doesn't, but then tell me how to fix my technology so it'll do it better next time. God bless you. Uh, until uh, Sunday, which is Mother's Day, remember that. And, uh, I've seen God's family as they stand in the presence of the King. As they lift their hearts and voices and their hands towards heaven raise. Yes, I've got a glimpse of heaven because I've seen God's people
Jerusalem.